the book of Daniel, a very fascinating book, and I've been looking forward to the study of the book of Daniel. And tonight, here we are, we're going to get into it, uh, this wonderful little book of Daniel. So, Daniel chapter 1, verse 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem, and he besieged it. Now, uh, Jehoiakim was not a good king. His father, Josiah, was an excellent king, but Jehoiakim was not a good king, and uh, through his uh, ruling over the people, there was a time of spiritual apostasy. And it was at this time that Nebuchadnezzar made his first invasion of the land of Israel and uh, did uh, conquer Jerusalem. And it was at this time that several of the captives were taken back to Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar among those was Daniel. And so uh, it's an uh, interesting time of history. And if you'll turn back in your Bibles to Jeremiah uh, chapter 25, uh, in the book of Jeremiah, it does cover this particular event of uh, Jehoiakim taking the captives back to Babylon. And we read, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah concerning all of the people of Judah in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, the king of Judah. And that was the first year of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, the which Jeremiah the prophet spake unto the people of Judah and all of the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, From the thirteenth year of Josiah, uh, the son of Ammon, the king of Judah, even unto this day, that is, the 23rd year, the word of the Lord hath come unto me, and I have spoken unto you, rising early and speaking, but you have not hearkened. And the Lord hath sent unto you all of his servants, the prophets, rising early, sending them, but you have not hearkened, nor inclined your ear to hear. And they said, Turn ye again now, every one, from his evil way, and from the evil of your doings, and dwell in the land that the Lord has given to you and to your fathers forever and ever. And go not after the gods to serve them and to worship them and provoke me to anger with the works of your hands, and I will do you no hurt. And yet you have not hearkened unto me, saith the Lord, that you might provoke me to anger, with the works of your hands and with your own, uh, to your own hurt. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, because you have not heard my words, behold, I will send and take all of the families of the north, saith the Lord, and Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and I will bring them against this land and against the inhabitants thereof and against all of these nations round about, and I will utterly destroy them and make them an astonishment, a hissing, and a perpetual desolations. Moreover, I will take from them the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness and the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride and the sounding of the millstones and the light of the candle. And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon for 70 years. And it shall come to pass that when the 70 years are accomplished, I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, saith the Lord, for their iniquity and the land of the Chaldeans will make it a perpetual desolation. I will bring upon that land all my words which I have pronounced against it, even all that I have written in this book which Jeremiah have prophesied against the nations. For many nations and great kings shall serve themselves of them, and I will recompense them according to their deeds and according to the work of their own hands. Uh, and so uh, the prophecy of 
Jeremiah that coincides with the prophecy of Daniel, and, and thus we recognize that they were contemporaries. Uh, Jeremiah was an older man. He had been prophesying for 23 years at this time, where Daniel was probably still a teenager and was taken as a captive to Babylon uh, to be raised in the Babylonian court and to be trained to be one of the counselors for uh, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. Uh, turning to Jeremiah chapter 36, uh, we find that Jeremiah speaks more of this uh, particular event, and of course it was a very important event. The first time that Jerusalem had been uh, conquered by their enemies and uh, Nebuchadnezzar the king. So in chapter 36, it came to pass in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, uh, the son of Josiah, and thus it would be at the same time as chapter 25 was written uh, in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, the king of Judah, that this word came unto Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Take thee a roll of a book, write therein all of the words that I have spoken un, uh, against Israel, against Judah, against the nations, from the day I spake unto thee to the days of Josiah, even unto this day. It may be that the house of Judah will hear all of the evil which I uh, purpose to do unto them, uh, that they may return every man from his evil way, that I may forgive their iniquity and their sin. So the purpose of God is to turn them away from the evil that they are doing, that they themselves might be spared the judgment of God. So Jeremiah called Baruch the son of Neriah, and Baruch wrote from the mouth of Jeremiah, that is, Jeremiah was uh, dictating to Baruch. He was the uh, oh, just writing the dictations from Jeremiah, all of the words of the Lord, which he had spoken unto him upon the roll of a book. And Jeremiah commanded Baruch, saying, I am shut up. I cannot go to the house of the Lord. Therefore, go and read this from this scroll, which you have written from my mouth, the words of the Lord to the ears of the people in the Lord's house upon the fasting day. And thou shalt read them in the ears of all Judah that come out of the cities. And it may be that they will present their supplications before the Lord and will return every one from his evil way. For great is the anger and the fury that the Lord hath pronounced against this people. And Baruch the son of Uriah did according to all that Jeremiah the prophet commanded him, reading in the book the words of the Lord in the Lord's house. And it came to pass in the fifth year of Jehoiakim, uh, the son of Josiah, the king of Judah, that in the ninth month that they proclaimed a fast before the Lord to all of the people in Jerusalem and to the people that came from the cities of Judah unto Jerusalem. And then read Baruch in the book the words of Jeremiah in the house of the Lord in the chamber of uh, Gamaria, the son of Shaphan, the scribe. In the higher court at the entry of the new gate and the Lord's house, and the new gate of the Lord's house in the ears of all of the people. And when Micaiah, the son of Gamaria, and the son of Shaphan, had heard out of the book all of the words of the Lord, then he went down into the king's house, into the scribe's chamber, and lo, all of the princes sat there, even Elishama, the scribe, and uh, Delaiah, the son of uh, Shemaiah, and Elnathan, uh, the son of Akbor, and Gamaria, the son of Shaphan, and uh, Zedekiah, the son of Hananiah, and all of the princes. And then Micaiah declared unto them all of the words that he had heard when Baruch read the book in the ears of the people. And therefore all of the princes uh, sent uh, and, uh, the, uh, uh, to Baruch, saying, Take in your hand the scroll wherein you have read in the ears of the people, 
and come. So Baruch, the son of Neriah, took uh, the scroll in his hand, and he came to them, and they said, Sit down here and read in our ears. And so Baruch read it to them in their ears. And now it came to pass, when they had heard all of the words, they were afraid, both one and another of uh, they said to Baruch, We will surely tell the king of all these words. And they asked Baruch, saying, Tell us now, how did you write these words at his mouth? And Baruch answered them and said, He pronounced all of these words unto me with his mouth, and I wrote them with ink in the book. And then the princes said unto Baruch, Go and hide you and Jeremiah. Don't let any man know where you are. And they went to the king into the court, uh, but they laid up in the scroll in the chamber of Elisha, the scribe, and told all of the words in the ears of the king. So the king sent uh, Jehudai to fetch the scroll. He took it out of Elisha, the scribe's chamber, and Jehudai read it to the ears of the king and the ears of all of the princes which stood beside the king. And now the king sat in the winter house. It was in the ninth month, and there was a fire in the hearth burning before him. And it came to pass, when Jehudai had read three or four leaves, he cut them with a penknife, cast them into the fire that was there on the hearth, until the scroll was consumed and the fire by the fire that was in the hearth. And yet they were not afraid, nor did they rent their garments, and neither the king nor his servants that heard all of these words. Uh, nevertheless, Elnathan read, and Deliah uh, and Gamaria had made intercession uh, to the king that he would not burn the scroll, but he would not hear them. Uh, but the king commanded uh, Jeramah, uh, Meal, the son of Hamalek, and uh, all of these names, uh, and the prophet, uh, uh, the scribe and Jeremiah the prophet, but the Lord hid them. Uh, it's interesting, we have an, some names here uh, in these names that are given to us, and uh, Gamaria and Shaphan, uh, this, the son of Shaphan. Uh, just recently in Israel, uh, there was found uh, these uh, in the diggings of uh, the old city of Jerusalem at the time uh, of the destruction of Jerusalem, uh, they found uh, these little uh, clay uh, seals. Yes, thank you. And uh, they were, uh, uh, they had the name of uh, Shaphan and Gamaria on them. And so modern day evidence that these men did exist and uh, their their seals were Gamaria was a scribe and he would uh, have, and he would put his seal on the documents and so they found uh, some of these seals of uh, Gamaria and uh, so it just sort of again confirms the word of God so uh, that sort of gives you then uh, the background. Uh, Daniel tied together with Jeremiah uh, because they did uh, exist at the same time together. But Daniel is now in Babylon. Jeremiah is still back in Jerusalem and ministering uh, to the people that were still there in Jerusalem. So uh, we do read it was in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, that Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem, and he besieged it. And the Lord gave uh, Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, into his hand with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, uh, to the house of his God. And he brought the vessels uh, into the treasure of the house of his God. So he took vessels from the temple, the gold and silver vessels that were used in the worship in the temple, and transferred them back to Babylon and put them in the house of his God there in Babylon. 
Uh, later on, you'll remember with Belshazzar, and we'll get this further down in the book of Daniel, how that uh, when Belshazzar took over the throne and was having this big party there in the palace within Babylon, how that he ordered when they had been, they'd gotten pretty drunk, he ordered that they bring these gold and silver vessels uh, that they had taken from the temple there in Jerusalem that they might drink their wine out of these uh, consecrated vessels. And uh, as they were drinking the wine, there came that writing on the wall. You remember the meany, meany, tekel you farson. Uh, we'll get to that in a few weeks as we move along through Daniel. So the king spoke to Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he would bring certain of the children of Israel uh, of the king's seed and of the princes. So uh, of these young men that were brought uh, to Babylon to be trained uh, to be a part of the uh, counselors for uh, Nebuchadnezzar, especially in issues that regarded uh, the Jewish people, uh, that uh, these uh, they were brought, and they were children in whom was no blemish. Uh, they were well favored. They were skillful in all wisdom, cunning in knowledge and understanding science and such as had the ability in them to stand in the king's palace to whom they might teach the learning of the Chaldeans and the language of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them for three years that at the end of the three years they might be brought before the king and be official uh, uh, scribes and so forth to advise the king. Now among these were uh, the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. But they gave them Babylonian names. Uh, Daniel was called uh, Belteshazzar, which means Bel's prince. Daniel means God is my judge but they changed his name to Bel's prince, Belteshazzar. Hananiah, uh, whom Jehovah has favored, they changed his name to Shadrach, which is illumined by the sun god. Uh, Michel, uh, which means who is comparable to God, they called him Meshach, who is comparable to Shak, who was the Babylonian goddess uh, e equivalent of Venus, the goddess of love and pleasure. And then Azariah, uh, whom Jehovah helps, they changed his name to Abednego, a servant of the shining fire. And so we read that uh, under the prince of the eunuchs, they gave the names under Daniel, the name of Bel uh, the Shazar, uh, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Michelle, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. But Daniel purposed in his heart he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank, and therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself. You know, true and lasting purposes are not made in your mind. I have decided, I have made up my mind. Well, that's good, but that doesn't always stand. When you purpose in your heart, it is really a full commitment. Uh, it is uh, a full determination. It isn't something that is going to be changing uh, according to uh, you know, the conditions around you, but it is something that is going to be a lasting kind of a uh, thing within your life. And that's why we encourage people not to just make up your mind to change. Uh, you know, there are people that are doing that all the time. Uh, you know, some fellow said, well, 
you know, I decided I'm not going to smoke anymore. And so I gave up smoking. Uh, and uh, I quit smoking. And you meet him, you know, a while later and he's smoking again. And he'll say, well, you know, uh, again, you see him and he says, well, I gave up smoking again. Uh, well, I've decided I'm not going to smoke anymore. I know it's uh, bad for me and I know it's not healthy. And so I've decided, no, that won't do it. You've got a purpose in your heart that, you know, this is a part of the old life. I'm not going to do that anymore. And those purposes, purpose of the heart, it usually will stand, whereas decisions are uh, changed all of the time and your mind is being changed. And so he purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with his portion of the king's meat and of the wine. And so he came to, uh, he was in, he actually was uh, favored by uh, the prince of the eunuchs and uh, the, now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. And the prince of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord, the king, who has appointed your meat and your drink, for why should he see your faces worse liking than the children which are of your sort? And then shall you make me endanger my head to the king. Then said Daniel to Melzar, who was the prince of the eunuchs, who had been set over Daniel uh, and Hananiah, Michelle, and Azariah, prove your servants, I beseech thee, for ten days. Let them give us vegetables to eat, water to drink, and then our countenance can be looked upon before thee, and the countenance of the children that eat the portion of the king's meat, as you see, then deal with thy servants. So he consented to them in this matter, and he proved them for ten days. And at the end of the ten days, their countenances appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than all of the children which did eat the portion of the king's meat. And thus Melzar took away the portion of the meat and of the wine that they should drink and gave them uh, the vegetables. And as for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill and all of the learning and wisdom of Dan and Daniel had understanding and all of the visions and dreams. So at the end of the days, uh, that is the three years of preparation uh, that the king had said that they should bring them in and then the prince of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar and the king communed with them and among them was found none like Daniel, Hananiah, Michelle, and Azariah. Therefore they stood before the king and in all of the matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them he found them ten times better uh, than all of the magicians and the astrologers uh, that were in all of his realm. And Daniel continued under the first year of King Cyrus. Daniel was probably in his early teens uh, when uh, he was brought to Babylon. He continued through the, four, the 70 years of uh, Nebuchadnezzar's reign in Babylon on into the uh, time when Babylon was conquered uh, by the Medes and the Persians and by Cyrus, uh, the king of the Persians. And uh, thus, uh, he was probably 90 years old uh, by the time you get to uh, some of the later adventures when Cyrus was uh, now uh, the uh, king uh, and his ministry unto uh, Cyrus and to Darius, the kings of the Medes and the Persians. So uh, he, he lived to be an old man, but he was uh, a very godly man and one that uh, I really do admire. One of the first ones I want to really meet when I get to heaven is Daniel. I'm looking forward to meeting him. I uh, know there will be a long line, but uh, <laughs> I just uh, have admired uh, Daniel from the time I was a child 
and my mother told me the stories of Daniel and read them to me out of the Bible. Uh, I've always uh, just looked up to this fellow, and I've just looked forward to meeting him and spending some time with him. Isn't that neat? We're going to have just, you know, maybe spend 100 years with him or so, uh, <laughs> because we're going to have all the time in the world when we get there. So, uh, you know, it, it won't be a matter of just uh, a 15 minute and you know, next and so forth, but uh, it, it just setting that aside and just, they're going to be, it's going to be an interesting, exciting experience when we get there. Getting into chapter two, this was in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar. He dreamed dreams wherewith his spirit was troubled and his sleep broke from him. And then the king commanded to call the magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers, the Chaldeans, to show the king his dreams. So they came and they stood before the king. And the king said unto them, I've dreamed a dream, and my spirit was troubled to know the dream. And so he spake to the Chaldeans and the king in Syriac, O king, live forever. Tell thy servants the dream, and we will show you the interpretation. And so the king answered and said to the Chaldeans, The thing is gone from me. I, I've forgotten it. And if you will not make known unto me the dream with the interpretation thereof, you will be cut in pieces. Your houses will be made a dunghill. Nebuchadnezzar wasn't a guy to mess with. Uh, and... Uh, he, uh, we find that uh, he was a cruel man, actually. Uh, you think of him having the three Hebrew children thrown into the burning, fiery furnace, and here he is threatening uh, the wise men, the counselors, uh, that they would be cut to pieces if they can't tell him the dream and give him the interpretation. But if you show the dream and the interpretation thereof, you will receive gifts and rewards, great honor. Therefore, show me the dream and the interpretation. They answered again and said, Let the king tell the servants the dream, and we will show you the interpretation of it. The king answered and said, I know of certainty that you would gain some time because you see that the thing is gone from me. But if you will not make known unto me the dream there is only one decree for you for you have prepared lying and corrupt words to speak before me till the time be changed therefore tell me the dream and i will know that you can show me the interpretation thereof the chaldeans answered before the king and said there is not a man on earth that can show the king's matter therefore there is no king Lord or ruler that have ever asked any such thing from the magicians or the astrologers or the Chaldeans. And it is a rare thing that the king requires. There is none other that can show it before the king except the gods who dwelling is not with flesh. For this cause the king was angry, very furious, and he commanded to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. And the decree went forth that the wise men should be slain, and they sought Daniel and his fellows uh, to be slain. Then Daniel answered with counsel and wisdom to Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, which was gone forth to slay the wise men of Babylon. And he answered and said to Arioch, the king's captain, Why is the decree so hasty from the king? Then Arioch made the thing known to Daniel, and then Daniel went in and desired of the king that he would give him time and that he would show to the king the interpretation. Then Daniel went to his house, and he made the thing known unto uh, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, that they would desire mercies of the God of heaven concerning the secret that Daniel and his fellows should not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. 
And then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision, and Daniel blessed the God of heaven, and Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changes the times and the seasons, he removes kings, he sets up kings, he gives wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. He receiveth the deep and the secret things, and he knoweth what the darkness and the light they dwell with him. I thank thee and praise thee, O thou God of my fathers, who has given me wisdom and might and has made known unto me now what we have desired of thee, for you have made now known unto us the king's matter. Therefore Daniel went into Arioch, whom the king had ordained to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went in and said to him, Destroy not the wise men of Babylon. Bring me before the king, and I will show unto the king the interpretation. So Arioch brought Daniel in to the king in haste and said thus to him, I have found a man of the captives of Judah that will make known unto the king the interpretation. The king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, Art thou able to make known unto me the dream which I have seen and the interpretation thereof? And Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king has demanded cannot the wise men and the astrologers or the magicians or soothsayers show unto the king. But there is a God in heaven that reveals secrets. And he makes known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. So this gives you now an a idea of what the dream is all about. It's the future of the world and what's going to take place in the latter days. And so this dream of Nebuchadnezzar dealt with issues of that time of history, but of history on down through and past our present age. In fact, the dream goes on into the very near future that is shaping up right now, and, and thus this dream becomes extremely important because the portions of it, of the latter days, are being fulfilled right now in this world in which we live, and thus we're going to be able to see things that the Lord uh, has promised we're going to transpire in these latter days. So thy dream and the visions of your head upon your bed are these. As for thee, O king, the thoughts came into your mind as you were there on your bed, what should come to pass hereafter? And he that revealeth secrets has made known unto thee what shall come to pass. And as for me, this secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than any living, but for their sakes that shall make, I shall make known unto you the interpretation uh, to the king that you may know the thoughts of your heart. Thou, O king, saw and behold there was a great image. This great image, uh, the brightness was excellent. It stood before thee and the form of it was awesome. Uh, the image head was of gold, uh, the breast and the arms of silver, uh, the belly and the thighs of brass, his legs of iron, and his feet were part iron and part clay. And you saw until there was a stone uh, that was cut without hands, which smote the image upon the feet uh, that were of iron and clay, and broke them to pieces, and then was the iron and the clay and the brass and the silver and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors and the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them and the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This is the dream and we will tell you the interpretation thereof before the king. For thou, O king, art a king of kings. The God of heaven has given to you a kingdom and power and strength and glory. 
And wherever the children of men dwell, and the beasts of the field, and the fowls of the heaven, he hath given into your hand, and he hath made thee a ruler over them all, uh, and so you are the head of gold. And after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to you, but it, uh, and then another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom will be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaks in pieces and subdues all things, and as iron that breaks all of these shall break in pieces and bruise. And whereas you saw the feet and the toes, part of potter's clay, part of iron. The kingdom will be divided, but there shall uh, be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as you saw the iron mixed with miry clay. And as the toes of the feet were part iron and part of clay, so the kingdom will be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas you saw the iron mixed with miry clay, and they mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave to one another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom uh, shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all of the kingdoms, and it shall stand forever." For as much as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. The dream is certain, the interpretation is sure. So then King Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face and he worshiped Daniel and commanded that they should offer an oblation and sweet odors unto him. And the king answered unto Daniel and said, Of a truth it is that your God is a God of gods and the Lord of kings, a revealer of secrets, seeing that you could reveal this secret. And then the king made Daniel a great man gave him many great gifts, made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and the chief of the governors over all of the wise men of Babylon. And then Daniel requested of the king and he set his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel sat at the gate of the king. So here is Daniel now greatly elevated uh, as far as his position there in Babylon. Uh, but Daniel's interpretation, showing to him the kingdoms that are going to rule over the world, beginning with the head of gold, the Babylonian kingdom, the first world-dominating empire. But the prophecy is that it would be replaced uh, by the... Uh, chest, the arms of silver. Uh, in the, as we move down further on in Daniel uh, chapter 5, 28, uh, we know that uh, the kingdom was going to be divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. And so uh, that would be the uh, chest of silver. Uh, then that in turn uh, would be uh, conquered by uh, the uh, Greece in Daniel 8.21, the rough goat is the king of Grecia. And so it speaks of Alexander the Great and his conquering of the world. But then we know that Alexander the Great was uh, conquered by uh, the Roman Empire and it became the strong governing empire over the world. So uh, the Lord is batting up to this point a thousand percent as he is listing for Daniel those world-dominating empires. Interesting that after the Roman Empire, there was no one nation that really dominated over the world, uh, but the Roman Empire just sort of uh, wasn't really conquered, uh, but just sort of uh, was 
uh, from within. It just, uh, because of the rotten planks, it just sort of disintegrated, uh, but wasn't truly conquered. And uh, so the final world governing empire will be made up of iron that is partly uh, strong, uh, but also mixed with clay and uh, thus partly weak. And uh, it will be not uh, like the other empires that have risen to world dominating powers. And uh, so uh, the 10 toes, uh, we have watched with great interest uh, the development of what they call the European community uh, because basically uh, that is part of the old Roman Empire, the European community today. And we have watched as the European community has got, uh, gathered together uh, with treaties and uh, breaking down sort of uh, the uh, walls of the nations and having a common uh, currency, the euro dollar, and uh, having uh, common borders and so forth are taking away the borders. And uh, so it, it's been interesting uh, to watch uh, the development of the, the European community, which we believe will, is a precursor uh, to this final world dominating power. Now, we know that uh, the issues that uh, are a threat to the development of the European community would be Russia and the Muslim nations of the East. And so it is interesting uh, that the Bible does tell us, and we've been studying this, uh, that uh, uh, Russia is going to join with Iran and other Muslim nations in an invasion of Israel in the last days. And when they come against the nation of Israel, that God is going to come against them and going to destroy this invading army. Five, six of them will be destroyed. It'll take seven months to bury the dead and uh, uh, they will cease to exist as a world dominating power, which will immediately give rise to Western Europe as the major force upon the European continent. And so it's interesting to watch these events taking place over there today. Uh, it's interesting how the Lord has put it right at the head of the uh, news cast and so forth, so you can't really miss uh, the fact that God is working in these areas and uh, it is something that is uh, coming to pass right before our eyes. So we are living in very exciting times as we've come to what the scripture describes as the latter years. What's going to happen in the last days or the latter years? In verse 45 of chapter 2, uh, the Lord said, For as much as you saw the stone uh, that was cut out of the mountains without hands, and it broke in pieces the iron and the brass and the clay, the silver and the gold. The great God hath made known unto the king what is going to come to pass hereafter. The dream is certain. The interpretation thereof is sure. And so God is saying to, uh, uh, through Daniel, uh, to the king, that God has shown to you What's going to be hereafter? The dream is certain. The interpretation is sure. It is during the time of this final European power that is rising. Uh, when it comes into power and so forth, it is during those days that the God of heaven will come and wipe out the earthly kingdoms of man. The second coming of Jesus Christ to establish God's kingdom upon the earth. That's what we're praying for when he told us, when you pray, you should say, thy kingdom come, thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. And that's exactly what we're praying for. Uh, the kingdom of our Lord to come. And he will come and put an end to the earthly kingdoms that have ruled over the world. And he will establish God's eternal kingdom. Uh, the rock grows into a mountain that covers the whole earth. And we know that he shall live and reign for a thousand years. And we, the church, will be with him, living and reigning with him over the earth. And this is yet future, but yet, as he said, the dream is certain and the interpretation thereof is sure. So you can be sure that this is going to happen just as it is predicted here. The dream is certain, the interpretation is sure, and you can count on it and watch as we do with excitement as these events are taking place in the world today that are bringing us to the culmination of human history such as we know it. Uh, the frustrated efforts of man to rule over other men without uh, graft and corruption creeping in and, uh, you know, every form of government that man has devised uh, just seems to have uh, the potential of corruption and ultimately they become corrupted and they pass off the scene. Of course, the United States was formed and our Constitution and uh, we almost uh, worship the Constitution, a tremendous document uh, written with great wisdom and I believe direction from God uh, but, you know, the changes that are being made today. And uh, we find that uh, our constitutional form of government is really uh, on the decline and uh, that uh, more and more uh, we are uh, eroding and corruption and graft and so forth have uh, again destroyed another kind of uh, experiment in trying to govern over men without corruption and all, but it just hasn't worked effectively. And thus, there is only one form of government, and that is, that is really sort of foolproof, and that is a dictatorship. But that depends upon the, the dictator being a good dictator, one that has the power. Uh, to make uh, the decisions, and the decisions are for the benefit of all, not for his own personal benefit. Uh, there have been other dictatorships, but yet uh, they've been corrupted because the dictator was corrupt. But if you had a righteous dictator who would dictate in righteousness, it would be an outstanding form of government, and that's just the kind of government that is around the corner, Jesus will come and he will rule and he will reign in righteousness. That is, the decisions that he will make will be righteous decisions, ruling in righteousness. And that is why we pray, Lord, thy kingdom come, thy will be done here on earth, even as it is in heaven. And that is the only hope that we have you know, we're going to be going to the polls again this year if the Lord is still tarrying by then. And uh, we uh, uh, are going to, well, we have already promises being made of, you know, what they will do and, you know, the glorious uh, future if you will just vote for, you know, and they'll tell you that they're the ones that can lead us into a golden age and all, but... Uh, it doesn't really matter who you vote for uh, because uh, it's not going to be with man that the kingdom is going to really come. It is only when the Lord does come and establish his kingdom that things are going to be done right and in order. And so that's our prayer. Lord, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done here on earth even as it is 
in heaven. So next week, we'll move on in Daniel chapters 3 and 4 and looking at uh, Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, it's interesting in chapter 3, uh, he makes a huge image, uh, but he makes the huge image of all gold. The image that he saw and the image that uh, the Lord had spoken against had a head of gold, had a, a chest of silver, had a stomach of brass, had legs of iron, uh, but he makes an uh, image all of gold. You, Nebuchadnezzar, are the head of gold, but he's defying, really, uh, the interpretation of this dream, though he acknowledges that no one could interpret like Daniel and all, yet he is defying the interpretation. And by making the image all of gold, he's really just saying the Babylonian kingdom is going to last forever. But did it? No. Who was right? <laughs> God was right. And you can be sure of that. God knows what the future holds, and he has given us insight into the future, and that's what makes the Bible such an exciting book in that God tells us things that are going to happen in the future that have not yet happened. And so we'll find this as we move through the book of Daniel, an amazing book because of the prophecies that are in the book of the things that are going to happen in the future. And as the Lord said there in chapter 1, the Lord is revealing what's going to happen in the latter days. And surely that's where we are living now in what we would refer to as the latter days. And so exciting days are coming and the Lord has let us know what's going to be happening in these days. And so uh, you can have a good heads up on the events, knowing exactly what's happening in our world today, understanding it from a biblical standpoint. And thus, you know, as the Bible said, you are not the children of darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. You're children of the light, and therefore walk as children of the light, not as in uncertainty, because we can be certain of the future. We know what the Lord has planned. He has laid out his plans for us in advance, and it's exciting to watch them come to pass right before our eyes, and we're living in exciting days. I'm just so thrilled to be living in these days in which we are living now because we can see the hand of God in the events of the world in which we live and God is on the throne and he's working out his eternal purposes and if you want to be on the right side just get on the Lord's side and you don't have to worry. Father we thank you again uh, for the insight that you give to us as far as the days in which we live. These latter days, Lord, in which you are fulfilling your word and your purposes and your plans. And now, Lord, we pray that tonight, as again we have this opportunity to study your word and to find out just what the future holds for the world in which we live, that we can Live, Lord, with confidence and assurance, knowing that your word is certain and that, Lord, the things that you have declared will indeed transpire just as you said. And so, Lord, help us that we might live in obedience to the word and follow, Lord, after you with our whole heart, knowing that time is short, and knowing that the opportunities uh, to serve you are fast closing and that we, Lord, need to lay aside every weight and sin which doth so easily beset us and run with patience this race that is set before us as we look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Bless, Lord, your people. Help us, Lord, this week.
to use up every opportunity that you set before us to share your love and your truth with a world that is lost and dying and without hope. Thank you, Lord, for the hope that we have in and through Jesus Christ. Bless now as we go forth to be your witnesses in the world in which we live. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.